great pleasure and great honor to become a member of Brazilian Academy and to address such a distinguished audience. All right, so, and as a topic I have selected today is, well, it is a global picture of dynamical systems. Well, it is, of course, a special privilege to talk about this in Rio de Janeiro because Rio is a center of dynamical systems and this topic is close to hearts of many of my friends, some of whom right here in this room. Okay, so let me go to, uh, so I, I will give a kind of slow historical presentation. Well, of course, it is a challenge for me also to uh, talk here because it is not a mathematical audience and you know mathematicians, they developed certain language and certain conceptual framework to make sure that nobody can understand them and so. <laughs> so, but I will try my best. So, but if I abuse language, so please stop me and ask what I mean. But so I will start with something that everybody knows. So from the very beginning, so Newton mathematical principles of natural philosophy. So it is 1687. And uh, so one thing that we can learn from this great work is that the world is governed by differential equations. And here is, so everybody knows this fundamental differential equation that acceleration of a moving particle is proportional to the forces acting on this particle. So in principle, if we know all the forces in the world, how the particles interact, we can integrate this differential equation and to find motions of all bodies so in all times in the future and in the past. And of course, a great success was integration of the two-body problem, say some planet rot so rotate moving around the sun. And so Newton justify using this fundamental laws. Newton, as everybody knows, justified Kepler's, Kepler's law of these motions. It was a great story. <coughs> okay, so what is a general frame for this kind of situation? So, uh, well, uh, so we need to understand some general notion of a dynamical system. And there are so dynamical systems with continuous time and dynamical systems with discrete time. Oh, sorry, so I did something wrong. Uh, uh, so, yeah, yeah. Okay, so dynamical systems with continuous time and dynamical system with discrete time, they're good friends. And basically, one can develop the theory in the frame that closer to his or her heart. And so dynamical systems of the, with continuous time, it is equivalent to differential equations. We have certain phase space, some certain, certain physical system which is described by some parameters. For instance, it could be some bodies and these parameters are just positions and velocities of these bodies. And so that is our phase space schematically. And if we know the velocities, how this, how this physical system develops uh, so in every uh, point of the phase space, then in principle we can integrate the system and obtain the picture of the phase portrait of this system, the trajectory. So we start with some moment and we go with given velocities, we go along the trajectories of the dynamical system and time runs to infinity and even in many cases to negative, in, well in these cases to negative infinity. Uh, uh, so, uh, so that is uh, that is the standard frame uh, of the dynamical systems, and Newton's equations is a particular case of such a framework. Or we can consider discrete time. In this case, we have some abstract space, some phase ab abstract phase space, and now instead of giving the field of velocities, vector field of velocities, we just give a rule how a point moves to another point in in at one moment. So now the time is discrete, it's just measure the positions of our systems, not continuously, but in first moment, second moment, third moment, and we have to prescribe the rule of this motion. This rule is given by certain map F from this phase space to itself. So we have some initial point, we apply the map F, so and we obtain the next, the next point, X1, we apply the map F, and we obtain the next point, x2, etc. And so uh, we obtain these trajectories of this dynamical system given by iteration of this map f. f to the m denotes here the m-fold iterate 
of the map effort. It's not the product, not of the break product, but we keep applying the same rule over and over again when we apply it m times. That is our m fold iterate of our map. So that is that is a framework for dynamical systems. And the first question to which uh, so naturally comes when we uh, learn Newton, whether we can solve explicitly such kind of dynamical systems. It's a given a vector field or differential equation, whether we can find a trajectory x of t at any moment t with any initial position, so um, explicitly, just by some explicit formula, so explicit integration, or similar, similarly for the street time. So, well, of course, Newton may suggest that this is the case, and one can integrate explicitly everything, and it is, would be not so difficult even. And it turns out that there are some disappointments on this, in this direction. Namely, if we consider, instead of two bodies, even three bodies, maybe it is better to think about Sun, Jupiter, and some asteroids, or some three bodies, and we try to uh, do what Newton did, then it is much harder problem, and it remained unsolved for good 200 years, and actually exactly in 1987, uh, sorry, in 1887, so 200 years after Newton's, uh, Newton's book, so the king of Sweden, Oscar II, established a prize so for solution, special prize, one of the first prizes in mathematics, I think, for a solution, explicit solution of three-body problem. So just to find explicit formulas as Newton did in the case of two bodies. And so Juan Carré submitted a manuscript and he won this prize, or he did not solve the problem, but so the development he uh, so made, so the breakthroughs he made in his work, so were considered so important, then still the prize was given to Poincaré despite the lack of explicit formulas. But what is much more important, from the at least from the point of view of uh, today's discussion, is that Poincaré completely changed a paradigm, actually, in his work. So, so he uh, so just faced, well, and people before him had faced so big difficulties explicitly integrating these differential equations so that he thought about different approach to the problem. And instead of explicitly solving differential equations, so he suggested that we can study qualitatively the trajectories of differential equations. For instance, we can ask whether the trajectory settled down in some equilibrium asymptotically, or it cycles like a pendulum asymptotically, or it does something more complicated. So, and that is a kind of question that appeared to be easier questions, and maybe one should go after these easier problems. That, is, was, that was a big change of paradigm. And Poincaré started to develop this theory, and he discovered that it is still an extremely difficult problem. He considered some simple situations, so well, the schematical depicted it here, where some net of two curves so intertwine one with the other, and he wanted to understand the structure of these curves, and here is his famous saying that he was struck by complexity of these figures that he even did not even attempt to draw. So he was not even attempting to draw. <coughs> so, so obviously, so that, uh, this hope that with this new approach, which allowed him to make bigger, so, so further progress, but still this approach faces some substantial difficulties. Okay, so, and about at the same time as Poincaré worked, there was another great physicist, mathematician, von Ludwig Boltzmann, so who introduced probabilistic ideas in this kind of problem. So, well, so we know that Boltzmann, so he's the founder of statistical mechanics, he considered big ensembles of particles, and so let us assume that these big ensembles and particles still so are uh, governed by Newton's laws. So in principle, we can try to, so to study the system, but because there are so many particles and the motion are so chaotic, then he suggested that there should be probabilistic laws that actually govern, this, uh, that, sh uh, that one should use to describe this kind of situation. And he also introduced, oops, sorry, I keep, keep 
pushing the wrong bottom. So he introduced uh, some conjecture, which has become known as ergodic hypothesis of Boltzmann. Well, here is here is a quotation. So that the great regularity of the thermal motion makes it probable that its atoms traverse all positions and velocities. So somehow our system, according to the statement, our system goes in some chaotic way through all points of the phase space. And of course, mathematicians know that it is impossible. So, but, so it took a several, several decades. So, and they made a perfectly good sense of this proposition, so suggested by Boltzmann. So that was uh, the beginning of the ergodic theory. So and in, in <coughs> the 1930s, so the names are von Neyman, Der Gobe, the founder of Hinchin, the founders of this theorem. Now, so uh, an important mathematical concept which we need to uh, have some feel for is a measure on our phase space. So with our phase space, it's certain set, Certain, so certain set, and on this set, we have a way to measure. Oops, so ah, we have a way to measure the size of subsets. So we take certain subsets in our phase space, and we measure its volume, roughly speaking. So everybody knows the usual volume, and the measure is a generalization of this notion of usual volume. So it can be much trickier than the usual model. It can be supported supported on some complicated set of with some irregular structure. So it is much more general notion, but keep in mind just, just the idea of a usual volume on the phase space. <coughs> and also, <coughs> so uh, it was Kalmogorov who suggested at about that time that probabil probability should be interpreted in this sense, or rather the measures could be interpreted as probability distributions on the phase space. So namely, if your measure is normalized, the total, me so the total mass, total volume of the phase space is one, then we can interpret this as probability distribution. And so when we calculate the size of certain subset, it is the probability that certain events happen. So somehow the points of our phase space are now interpreted as events, and probability of event is just the size of the phase space so measured according to this probability measure. Okay, so, <coughs> well, so that is the notion that I will use over and over again, the notion of a measure. And if we have a dynamical system, then there is a natural way to make sense of the statement that this dynamical system preserves certain measures. So we can talk about invariant measures. And ergodic theory started with studying a sort of typical orbits with respect to invariant measures for dynamical systems. And typical means that something happens with full probability, so in the sense of this measure. So just if we neglect uh, some set of events of zero probability, then for others we can make certain meaningful statements. And so what happens in this situation? That this measure governs almost all orbits with respect to itself. So if we take some orbit, x0, x1, etc. And if we calculate how much time in average it spends in certain sense, in certain sense, it will asymptotically approach the measure of this set. So the probability of this event. So the orbit, well, there is important ergodicity uh, uh, assumptions in order to make this kind of statement. This statement is the content of what mathematicians call ergodic theorem. And it happens under ergodicity assumption. And ergodicity assumption tells us that the dynamical system in some sense is decomposable. So and if the dynamical system is, dec is in decomposable, you take a typical initial point, and it will go around the phase space densely on the support of this measure and visit every subset with frequencies which are proportional to the measure of this subset. That is the context of the ergodic theorem, which was a great achievement in the theory of dynamical systems as of that time. Or you can also say in, in this way, so if you take any observable, and if observable phi, it is some function on our phase space, and if you average this observable over time, 
then it is the same as average this observable over the space. So the time averages are the same as the space averages. And this was basically the idea of Boltzmann, the idea of his ergodic hypothesis. Of course, there is an assumption of ergodicity. This assumption does not come for free. Okay, and here is our next hero is Kalmogorov. So I already mentioned his name, who it was Kalmogorov, who actually believed interpreted measures as probability distributions. And uh, so his address in at the Inter International Congress of Mathematicians in 56 in Amsterdam was another turning point in this in our field. Uh, so basically, so he suggested very strongly the idea that if we have some physical dynamical systems, and dynamical systems coming from physics or from other branches of natural science, we, we should approach it from the measure theoretic or from probabilistic point of view. So there is no chance that we can understand all dynamical systems, all orbits of all dynamical systems. Just the world of dynamical systems is too complicated. But we have to put a more modest problem approach. We have to take a more modest approach. Namely, we should select some representative dynamical system, some typical, in some sense, dynamical system, and <coughs> to try so, and uh, uh, to try to understand, to try to understand typical orbits, typical orbits for this typical dynamical system. So that is what he says. That measure theoretic point of view is physically natural, and he points out to. Uh, mathematical difficulties that the space of dynamical systems is infinite dimensional and it is difficult to develop so measure theory in these spaces. But he also himself suggested some way around this problem. Uh -uh. All right, so let us, let us now go further. So it was 50s of the last century and we now go to 60s and 70s when another new idea emerged, idea of hyperbolicity. And basically, so hyperbolicity means, roughly speaking, some very strong instability of trajectories, very strong instability of trajectories. And it was realized at that time that somehow this instability could help. There are very simple models with very strongly unstable trajectories, like the picture that I have, I have drawn here, so this, which is called the smell horseshoe, so we have some box and you just map it in such a way so onto itself and then you start to iterate whenever it is possible. And so it is actually not so difficult to understand this dynamical system and still it exhibits this exponential instability of orbit. And <coughs> so, and actually, so Smail who suggested this model, so he also, gave an answer to puzzle, to Poincare's puzzle of these curves that Poincare could not draw. And this model produces an extremely, this horseshoe produces an extremely well treatable, quite easily treatable model for these curves, which is now called Knester continuum. So it's some curves that go like that around and around and around. Of course, there is some complexity here. So you see here several gaps but if you blow up picture here, you will see more gaps. And if you blow up further, you will see more and more gaps. As a mathem mathematician says, there is a counter type, counter type structure, transversal counter type structure, when there are gaps all over the place. So it is quite a complicated picture. And still, it is a precise topological, topological model. Uh -uh. So there was this idea of controlled instability. Orbits are tremendously unstable, and still, there are good models, and moreover, the system is robust, so if you perturb the system, so the whole phase portrait qualitatively will remain the same. And moreover, there is some way of description of almost all orbits for this kind of system. There is quite a good way of description of these orbits. And it is related to the another important notion which emerged in that time. It is the notion of an attractor. So attractor, is an invariant set which attracts many orbits. And many should be understood in probabilistic sense. So also in, in terms of some natural volume in the phase space, just natural volume that we think you could think of. So um, there is good probability 
good probabilities that the orbits will asymptotically accumulate on this set. And there are some simple situations of such attractors. It is just cycles, attracting cycles. You can have finitely many points which are just permuted by, the, by dynamics. This go to that, and then it returns back under a certain amount of iterates. And so it is a cycle, and it can happen that nearby orbits asymptotically converge to this cyclic behavior. So it is pretty well understood. Uh, his picture, let us call it regular dynamics produced by an attracting cycle. Or it could be some strange attractors. So strange means that some attractors which mo with more complicated structure, like this cluster continuum, maybe with some transverse counter structure. So, but still, so and the dynamics on these attractors could be exponential and stable. So it is okay, but still there could be, if you take a nearby point, this nearby point will converge to this attractor. And so this instability, exponential instability on the attractor is compatible with the fact that the attractor can attract many points, many nearby points. And this is a situation which we refer to as chaotic or stochastic because the dynamic on this attractor is kind of chaotic and instable stochastic dynamics which is ruled by probabilistic random so uh, laws so that's why they go stochastic so uh, and still it is an attractor so this uh, this uh, um, in this attractor uh, sort of governs the behavior of many points nearby uh -huh. all right and there could be also so I should say that this attractor can, su can support some measure which is called the physical measure physical measure, so this measure sits on this tiny set, and if you take, take a nearby point, then the distribution of this point when it approaches this attractor is governed by this, this physical measure, in the sense as, in the similar sense as was described when I formulated for you the ergodic theorem of Virgov and von Neumann. Okay, so there are these two type of behaviors, two type of attractors, regular attractors, some cycles and some strange attractors with some physical measures that govern behavior in such a way that it could be considered stochastic. All right, and finally, so one more thing that was one more phenomenon which was realized in 60s and 70s that actually all this could be observed already in low dimensions. Somehow in order to observe some probabilistic mechanisms, or probabilistic descriptions of the systems. So one does not need to go to these Boltzmann uh, systems with many, many particles involved, very high dimensional systems. One can go to dimension three and try to very simple system, very system system of three differential equations, which is called the Lorentz, Lorentz uh, system. And so then there will be such an attractor and there will be a, so at least experiment in the 60, in so made by so meteorologist actually not a not a mathematician so in 1963 so showed that this kind of system of so uh, exhibits extremely interesting sort of chaotic behavior so uh, with the presence of this nice butterfly which rules uh, rules behavior of the orbits in some extremely interesting way. And you don't need to go to high dimensions. And then people even went one dimension down, so, and this is extremely simple equation, so, well, so from, it is just simplest equations you can, you can imagine, so, to write down, simple fo simplest formulas you can imagine to write down, so there is some map. Now it is a discrete dynamical system. The previous one was differential equations in dimension three, and now we write a map given by this quadratic formula. So in dimension two, and it was observed by Henon in 70s, then again there is a very interest attractor, this intricate concept that uh, so governs behavior of points nearby, at least experimentally. And then people went even further one dimension da down and considered just one dimensional map. Now we have just one variable, one dimensional phase space. We cannot go down so below that. So, so and wrote the simplest possible formula one can imagine. That is what is called logistic, logistic equation of quadratic, quadratic 
people are normal. And so they observe that the dynamics in this family is very interesting. So if we start with C sufficiently, so if we start with C from one quarter, and well, from one quarter is somewhere here, it is one quarter, and go down, then you will observe an attract and fix point for this map. Then this attract and fix point bifurcates to attract and cycle of period two. Then it bifurcates to an attract and cycle of period four, etc. You have this cascade of Dublin bifurcations, and then it accumulates in some interesting way to the limit, and then after that one, so observe some intricate interplay between regular and stochastic behavior. For some parameters, for instance here, we observe an attracting cycle of period three and almost everything converges to this attracting cycle. It is a regular map according to our discussion. And somewhere here with this black region, clearly it's observable. So over here towards the end, it is parameter C equal to negative two. So there are, ob apparently there are some maps for which some kind of stochastic chaotic behavior is observed. So uh, that was so just a big realization in 70s that one should not go beyond dimension one in order to observe very interesting phenomena of interplay between regular and stochastic dynamics. Okay, so, and uh, now, so all the previous discussion can be summarized. Now, uh, and so it was articulated in 90s by Zakopales. So who put forward this fundamental conjecture that at least for low dimensions in dimensions one and two, so if we take a typical dynamic, um, dynamical system, the typical dynamical system, and it should be understood in some sense suggested by Kolmogorov, uh, then such a system will have finitely many attractors that govern behavior of almost all orbits, of typical orbits. And moreover, these attractors are of two types. It is either attracting cycles, which produce some regular behavior, as we saw, or it is some strange attractors that produce some stochastic behavior. So you see, it is some version, if you like, of ergodicity conjecture by Boltzmann. So ergodicity means that there is the system is indecomposable. Of course, it, is, it cannot be anticipated in general, in this general framework. But at least one can anticipate that typically it exhibits only finitely. It is decomposable, but there are only finitely many regimes which rule the global dynamics of this dynamical system. So, <coughs> and well, in the same, actually, uh, about at the same time as Jacob proposed this conjecture, so I actually gave the uh, first confirmation of it in the logistic family that we have just looked at in this very simple, the simplest possible one-dimensional one dimensional family. So I have shown that indeed for almost any parameter C, the corresponding dynamical system is either regular or stochastic. And regular means that there is an attraction cycle and almost all orbits converge to this attraction cycle. And stochastic means that there is some invariant measure, this ex exponential instability that governs behavior of almost all orbits of our, of our system. Actually, Interestingly, uh, so good part, one part of this result appeared in the same volume as Jacob conjecture was formulated. <coughs> okay, so, but you can ask after that, so, well, so, okay, so it's just logistic family, so that's not what Kalmagora wanted. He wanted some, some typical family of dynamical systems, so, and maybe it is extremely special and nothing like that would be observed in more general uh, families. And so actually at that time, so Wellington de Mello introduced to me his new student, Arturo Avila, who was 19 years old and just was beginning his studies in dynamical systems. And so he suggested that we should try to work on generalizing this theorem to typical families of maps which look like quadratic polynomials. Quadratic polynomials, so the shape of quadratic map is like that. So the graph of quadratic map is like that. And so let us consider instead of quadratic map, 
unimodal map. General unimodal map, it just means that it is, has the same shape, but can be much more general, so it is infinite, in, infinite dimensional space of such maps. And we started to work on this result, and in a couple of years we had a result that indeed, so actually the same happens in a typical, the same dichotomy, regular or stochastic dichotomy, actually is true in a generic uh, family of unimodal maps. And what it means to be generic, it is very explicit in this result, and probably one cannot uh, cannot ask for more than is suggested here. This was, so I think one of the first Arthur's works was part of his thesis, and so it was not bad beginning of Arthur's mathematical career. <coughs> so you see, so it is a kind of as, uh, probably as complete picture uh, in the spirit of uh, Kalmogorov and in the spirit of Pali's conjecture, in this, but in this very particular family of unimodal maps. Okay, so, uh, uh, so let me, uh, I have like five minutes more, can I take, or not? Five minutes more? Yeah, uh, uh, so let me, uh, so you can think that again, so it is very special class of maps, so, so why, why to bother? Let me give you indication, so what kind of ideas go into this theory that you see that even this particular case of the police and police conjecture is really big. Uh, uh, so there are basically two ideas that I would like to emphasize. One of these ideas is the idea of renormalization and universality. And this idea came from physics and it's actually from elementary particle physics and it's what is called now quantum field theory. So it is the idea that so if in the space, time, we go from scale to scale, then we have to recalculate all the parameters according to certain rule. So and that is this rule is called renormalization. So that the world does not look the same in all scales, but there is this re, uh, recalculation, recalculation rule, uh, which, which is known as the world, world of normalization, and it is a very big deal in the quantum field theory, which ultimately allows to predict uh, all these properties of elementary particles. <coughs> so, and this idea was brought to dynamics from physics by Feigenbaum, Collier, and Visser in the 70s, and they suggested that, at l that, for instance, in this special space of unimodal maps, similar normalization idea, but very explicit and much more precise, which can be formulated much easier and more precisely, is still true. And there is some universality which is governed by this normalization procedure, that all the unimodal maps, in some sense, look the same in small scales, and the, all the parameter spaces look the same in small scale, in, 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 in some very strong sense. For instance, if we look at this sequence of Dublin bifurcations in the logistic family, if we take just a similar family of unimodal map, then we observe the similar cascade of Dublin bifurcations with the same rate of convergence to the limit. Uh, and this same rate of convergence to the limit is like universality in physics. So, and this idea played extremely important role in the above results. So, so this renormalization feature was justified in the 90s in the work by Dennis Sullivan, McNullin, and myself, and then further there was a very important contribution by Arthur Avila. <coughs> it is one of the ideas, and the other idea that I would like to emphasize is the role of complex numbers. Well, of course, mathematicians, physicists, engineers all know what complex numbers are, so maybe there are some people in the room who never knew it, but never saw them. So, but anyway, so, well, when we talk about real numbers, so we place them on the line. When we talk about complex numbers, we plan, place them in the plane, which is called the complex plane, and we can operate with them in the way as we do with the real numbers. And so, uh, so when they were invented, they were considered to be just pure imaginary. So these complex numbers were called imaginary numbers, 
and so which have basically nothing to do with the real world. It turned out that it is not the case. So over the centuries, mathematicians and physicists so uh, r realize and deeper and deeper that our real world is governed by this imaginary complex world. And so it was articulated in the 19th, uh, in the, in the 19th century by Penleve and Adamar, who said famously, between two truths in the real domain, the easiest and shortest path quite often passes through the complex domain. So, and there has been so many confirmation of this uh, that just it is impossible now to argue with the truth of this statement. And in particular, in dynamics, the complex ideas started to play extremely important role in the beginning of 20th century. So complex dynamics was founded by Fatou and Julia, and towards the end of 20th century, it became just clear that it is an intrinsic part of the dynamics of systems theory. And in particular, the previous results depend very strongly on the ideas of the complex dynamics. So I put here some definitions for mathematicians can, can so briefly scroll through these definitions of the main complex objects. Julia said, Mandelbrot said, some important conjecture by Doege and Hubbard. So, but, so what is interesting that all this played so this crucial role to justify that picture that was formulated in purely real terms. We were talking about one dimensional real quadratic family, but in order to understand this real quadratic family, we had to go to the imaginary complex domain and to work there. So, and it gave tremendous insight into the whole story. Well, so let me finish with, with several pictures. So here is a picture of Doge Rabbit, one picture of the Julia set. Yes, I, I'm putting here some pictures on the complex plane, pictures of dynamical objects in the complex plane. Surely most people saw them, so, but I don't have time to define them and probably there is no point. It is the, the Mandelbrot set, and the Mandelbrot set has extremely interesting self-similarity features. If you, for instance, blow up the Mandelbrot set here, or somewhere here, you will see a little copy of the Mandelbrot set, which looks exactly the same, exactly the same as the Mandelbrot set. And there is a very good and deep explanation for that, and it again comes from the renormalization now in the complex dynamics. So that is, so just the, maybe just the first steps towards the Pallis conjecture it is not finished even in dimension one because we are talking only about so far about unimodal maps and there are more complicated, more complicated one dimensional maps. And in dimension two, there has been some important work so far, but the story just begins. And certainly two dimensional story is going to be uh, one of the central stories in the dynamical systems theory in 21st century. So it's probably a long, long time to go. Maybe there are some students here who would take a task. Okay. Thank you.